Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 134, Dr. Jeffrey Kupersky on 10 Science and Religion Myths, Part 2. As an undergraduate, Dr. Jeffrey Kupersky studied electrical engineering, but he went on to earn an MA and a PhD in philosophy from The Ohio State University. He's been a professor at Saginaw Valley State University in Michigan since 1997. A specialist in philosophy of science and philosophy of religion, he's published articles in many professional journals, including Philosophy of Science, the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, Zygon, and the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. But he's here with us today to talk about some of the themes discussed in his 2015 book entitled The Physics of Theism, God, Physics, and the Philosophy of Science. Dr. Kopersky, welcome back to the Trinity's podcast. Thanks, Dale. I'm glad to be here. We're talking about some themes from your book, The Physics of Theism, God, Physics, and the Philosophy of Science. And it's a deep book. It gives you kind of -of state-of-the-art discussion about a lot of things. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And it gets into more even than we can talk about in these two interviews. But we came up with a list of 10 science and religion myths. And these are things that are discussed in your book, in many cases, in some depth. So why don't we jump into the last five of them? Sure, go ahead. So number five is, science and religion are separate realms of inquiry. Science tells us what and how, and religion tells us why. Well, I think that science and religion, that they are largely independent of each other. There's nothing unusual about it. It's kind of like saying that accounting is largely independent of botany. They're just different subjects. Accountants don't need to know about plants. Uh, Different disciplines have their own questions, uh, their own jargon, their own values. And so an expert in one field doesn't have to care about what's going on elsewhere, although it might be useful from time to time. But this idea gets taken to extremes when it comes to um, science and religion. So really what you're referring to here is what scholars often call the independence model that science and religion have nothing to do with each other whatsoever. Science is all about reason and evidence, and religion is all about ethics and values and more ultimate concerns. And so they're just completely independent of one another. They got nothing to do with each other whatsoever. And a lot of scientists like this view because then it allows them to ignore a lot of things that they don't want to talk about. If a biology professor has a creationist student raising objections, well, he can just say, well, that's really a religious matter, and here we're doing science. And so you can just, you know, bracket certain things into the not science camp. The model has some famous supporters. I think probably the most famous was the American paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould. And I think he saw it really, one of the virtues was that it does keep people from fighting. Science and religion, if they are completely independent, they can't be at war with one another if they're about fundamentally different things. So, you know, art history can't be at war with biochemistry because they don't have any common ground to fight about. So in his view, science and religion, same thing. They're about completely different things. So there's just nothing to fight about. And actually some theists embrace this model too. So If religion is all about, say, feelings of devotion or whatever one finds of of most value, then if that's what religion is about, then we're safe. No matter what science comes up with, it can't hurt us because religious faith has nothing whatsoever to do with with scientific truth on this view. Science can't hurt us because whatever science comes up, it's just irrelevant to what we do. And you see the, the seeds of that sort of view in the 19th century. Ultimately, I think the independence model just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. You really can't find many scholars who who hold this position. This is one of the few places where I actually agree with Richard Dawkins. He's also not a fan of the independence model. One reason to doubt it is just the history that we talked about last time. I try to make a case that theism has had a tremendous influence on the development of early science. The idea that there are laws in nature, that they apply uniformly everywhere, that experiments and observation, that those are important and that we can discover truths through them. All of those had theistic roots. Now, beyond that, religion isn't just about ethics and and value and faith. Religion makes existence claims. 
God exists. That's not an ethical claim. Souls exist. That's a claim about the nature of human beings. Just take miracles. So presumably, the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, that's supposed to have been a historical event. If you were there, you would have seen this guy walking out of the tomb. That's not about ethics. That's not about value. That's you know about observable events. And I could give a couple non-Christian examples too. A religion might tell you that if you uh, give an offering to this one idol or this one deity, you'll be protected from highway robbers. Right? Then you get robbed. Yeah. Or <laughs> <laughs> the specially blessed ghost dance sure cannot be penetrated by the white man's bullets. Yes. That was actually claimed by a prophet in the ghost dance movement in the late 19th century. And yeah, this wasn't just a, a why question or a why yeah. statement. Yeah. This was supposed to have observable consequences which are supposed to be the realm of science on this, this kind of you know, stereotypical view. And if you go the other way, see, I, I would also say it's pretty obvious that it's not as if science steers clear of religion. There are lots of papers and people who specialize in the psychology of religion and the, and the sociology of religions. So science and religion, they do, in fact, overlap at times. As I said, maybe not a lot, and that's okay. That's fine. If you don't like doing interdisciplinary work, then don't do it. But I do think that it's a good idea for some of us to be working along the border areas. Yeah, if you have a weeping statue in your church and a scientist has a theory about why that might be and it's a natural explanation, I, it's hard to see how you could ignore that. Right. Yeah. And that would be a very good, helpful, I think, interface between science uh, and religion. Or the, the sort of, I think this can be taken too far as well. People are sometimes too zealous in it, but you have, you have scientists that want to debunk certain religious and other, other sort of supernatural claims. And, and oftentimes they will find you know, matters of fraud in, in people who are claiming to have haunted houses and, and other such things. And if you have a person who claims to be getting you know, information from God and they're actually a fraud, I'm happy that that person is outed. Uh, I don't want people to be defrauding innocent folks who, are, who think they actually you know, have some sort of connection to God. Myth number four is science has revealed a universe without design or purpose. At least since Darwin, I think that has largely been thought to be true because a lot of the best examples of design uh, seem to be able to be explained just by way of adaptation. It seemed like, at least in the realm of biology, that you, you really didn't need the notion of design anymore. The interesting thing that I talk about in the book is that physicists started making some very surprising discoveries where it seems to at least open the door again to matters of design or purpose. This is all fairly recent. You know, we always knew, physicists and biologists have long known that if certain fundamental physical constants had been different, then life would have evolved differently. So something just like, say, gravity, Newtonian gravity. Newton's law says you know, that the force has to do with, between two objects, has to do with their masses and then how far apart they are. And if you, you look at the equation, there's this capital G in there. It's just a constant, it's just a number. It's, it's not something we can derive from some more basic law. It's just something we have to put in there to get the right results. And so, you know, for decades, biologists would have said if G had been a little bigger, that that fundamental constant had been larger, then that would mean that gravity was a little bit stronger. And so things like giraffes probably would not have evolved because you, know, you just couldn't get the blood to pump all the way up to their brains if gravity is trying to, to pull it back down. What physicists have found instead is that if G were different, even by a, a very, very tiny amount, life itself would be impossible anywhere in the universe. And that's just one example. If you make a slight change to electromagnetism or the strong nuclear force or the weak nuclear force, it's not just that things are different, but they're dramatically different, uh, especially for us, because life would be impossible, not just here on Earth, but everywhere in the universe. Now, that was a surprise because, at least from a naturalistic point of view, nature shouldn't care about whether life exists. If you balance a pin on its tip, nature doesn't care about which way that pin drops. Even if your life somehow depends on it, the pin doesn't care. So then the question is, why do all of these fundamental constants, and there are about 25 or so examples like this, why do they all have values that are in these very, very narrow life-permitting ranges because it seems like these values, there's, as if these were you know, big dials in, in the cosmos, that they were all set with life in mind. So here's an analogy. 
say you enter a poker tournament and you sit down and a guy comes up to you with a gun and tells you that if you don't win every hand, he's going to shoot you. Winning every hand, that is statistically possible, but it, it, it's highly unlikely because, you know, the cards don't care whether you live or die. So under this scenario, you, you're probably going to die. But let's say that you do win every hand. That would be the sort of thing that then seems to cry out for an explanation because, again, the cards don't care. It looks like someone has done something to help ensure that you don't die. And something like this, this is what physicists have discovered about nature. It looks like the deck has been stacked in our favor. And so now the question is, is why? Why is that the case? And at least one answer seems to be that the universe looks fine-tuned for life because it literally was fine-tuned for life. God created a world in which the laws permit creatures like us to exist. And personally, I think this is actually one of the best arguments we have right now for philosophical arguments that we have for the existence of God. And it came quite unexpectedly from recent physics. The whole fine-tuning argument, it is controversial. I don't spend a lot of time in the book on the examples because this is kind of well-known now. You can find the examples all over the place. In the book, I'm looking more at the arguments pro and con back and forth. Yes, and we get into some deep waters in that part, too. It's very interesting. Yes, you do. Because in part, I wanted to make sure that I took on some of the, the more rigorous arguments, not just present that at a popular level. I think you can find this argument, the fine-tuning argument, in more popular places. I'm sure that you can, as I've seen it. But philosophers of, of physics, philosophers of science, and some, some scientists, yeah, they've, they've got some uh, interesting objections. And so, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to take those on in, in, in some detail. In addition to the discussion in your book, where do you think a person should look for a good, fuller presentation of the fine-tuning design argument for God's existence? Oh, that's a good question. You know, there's a multi-volume work the philosopher uh, Robin Collins has been working on really forever. We thought that he would have that book done quite a while ago, but it just keeps going on. So uh, eventually, that will be the definitive work when it's finally published. And Dr. Collins does have some very well done short papers, kind of chapter length presentations, which you can find online. I'll put a link to those on the blog post for this episode. Yeah, I think that would be good. Yeah. And he does things. Uh, there's a, a variety of things, some at a more popular level, more easily accessible, and then some that are more rigorous. So, so yeah, I think that would be the place to look. number three is science by definition adheres to methodological naturalism, which is a commitment to explain events only in terms of natural laws and physical entities. Right. Well, first, we would need to distinguish two types of naturalism. This is commonly done. So there's metaphysical naturalism, and that says that there is nothing. It's a, it's a metaphysical claim. There is nothing beyond the natural order. Uh, so a couple of centuries ago, we would have called this materialism. That would be the view that everything is made of matter. Now things are a little more complicated, so we, we talk about naturalism. But ultimately, it's the, it's the same basic idea. All that exists is natural stuff. Now, methodological naturalism, that's a research claim. What it says is scientists must proceed as if metaphysical naturalism were true, regardless of what they believe. So, you know, you might believe in God and be a scientist, but don't use God, don't appeal to God when you're doing science. Do science like a metaphysical naturalist would. A lot of philosophers and a lot of scientists do think that methodological naturalism is part of science, as you say, by definition. There are a few, including a handful of prominent atheists like W. V. O. Quine, Philip Kitcher. They disagree. They don't think that there is sort of a fixed definition of, of, of science that includes methodological naturalism. And I tend to agree with them. I hold the minority view here, in part because I, I don't see any clear demarcation between science and philosophy and religion. The whole demarcation issue that philosophers gave that up a long time ago because it just seemed to be impossible. 
most people who declare that there is this clear boundary between science and non-science, generally that's just imposed. They just lay it down in some particular place so that then they can say things like intelligent design, you know, they're on the wrong side of the line, just find a way to define all that stuff as religion so that we don't have to deal with it anymore. This is one of the places where I think there's a big gap between popular thinking and what real philosophers of science think. In popular thinking, children are told in school, well, there's this thing, the scientific method, <laughs> which is unique to science, and other fields don't practice the scientific method, so... They're yeah. not as good. Well, why isn't it just that simple? Why, you know, you got observations, you formulate theories, that's the scientific method. Most philosophers don't think there is a scientific method, that there is this one particular method that is both unique to science and then disciplines outside of science don't use. They're doing something else. If you look over the history of science, and I, I do a little bit of this in the book, you'll find lots of different emphases on, on different ways of making scientific inferences. Some thought that induction was very important. Others thought that deduction was very important. Karl Popper thought that induction was impossible for reasons that David Hume said. And so there's been lots of things that we could call the scientific method. See, I think that philosopher Larry Loudon actually had the right view about all this um, years ago. And, and what he said is, look, if you don't like creationism or you don't like intelligent design, that's fine. Listen to their arguments and then tell us what's wrong with those arguments. What you shouldn't do is simply define them as non-science, lay down this demarcation, put the things that you like on this side and things you don't like on that side, and then to say that now intelligent design has been refuted because it's, it's not science. So don't try to win the argument by way of demarcation. Listen to the arguments and tell us what's wrong. That's the way to go. When you think about it, that's a bizarre way of arguing. I mean, suppose I'm a Christian and I'm talking to my Buddhist friend, and he's trying to convince me of some Buddhist claim, and I say, well, that's not religion, man. Religion is stuff about God and Jesus and the Bible and Christianity. Buddhism, that's not religion. That's superstition or something like that. Yeah, it's completely arbitrary. It would be insulting. <laughs> it's like cheating, really. Yeah. I mean, if he has some grounds to prove, you know, that some mantra works or the no self doctrine is true or something, I had to just listen out what he's going to say and, and then start objecting, not inform him that he's talking about a different subject. Right. So starting with definitions. Yeah, I just think that's, that's just the wrong approach. Rather than saying that, say, even methodological naturalism, rather than saying it's part of the definition of science, really, I think the way to think of it is it's one of those shaping principles that I keep talking about. Good scientific explanations should be naturalistic in the same sense that they should be as simple as possible, or they, they should be fruitful for future research, or that they, they should fit with what we already know. So, in other words, you know, if there's no need to bring God into the picture, then don't do it. What people want to do is make this, again, a necessary condition for science. It's not science if it doesn't have this particular shaping principle, but the shaping principles don't work that way. They're not ironclad, and they're not the same through all the history of science. I give a lot of examples in the book where principles are sometimes ignored, sometimes they're traded off against each other, sometimes they're rejected outright. It really just depends on what we discover. So yeah, we prefer simple explanations. But sometimes the simple explanation is just wrong. So the bottom line is, you can't say that a given shaping principle is fixed in stone because you just don't know what's out there on the horizon. And I think that's what I want to say about methodological naturalism. Let science pursue naturalistic explanations as far as they'll go. But you can't guarantee today that what you find tomorrow will have a true naturalistic explanation. Metaphysical naturalists are betting that there will always be such an explanation, but that's just an expression of faith. It's faith in naturalism. I'm a Quinean on this. I follow the philosopher W.B.O. Quine. If something is discovered that requires a supernatural explanation, that could still count as science. Again, it's a minority view, but just take an extreme example. Say that our DNA contains coded language that when you decode it says things like, designed by Yahweh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not betting on that, okay? But I don't think that biologists should you know, have to say, well, we have to ignore that because that's not science. But I think that's the kind of move that you would have to make if you draw these boundaries and if you include methodological naturalism as part of the definition of science itself. I'd much rather let science go where it needs to go and we'll see. 
probably naturalism, methodological naturalism is going to work just fine. But, you know, it might not. In the history of science, shaping principles come and go. I have to think that in days gone by, you might have got yourself in trouble committing to similar ideas. Take somebody like John Locke. He seems to think of interactions between physical objects on a kind of mechanical model. Mm -hmm. Say that you had a principle that scientific explanations should appeal to mechanistic models or something. Good. Basically pushing and pulling. Right. The matter could stick together or one piece could push another piece out of the way. Contact forces. Is what yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no action at a distance. and mm -hmm. But this has just gone out the window in the last hundred years. It's a really good example. You have an established shaping principle that good science includes a mechanism of some kind, a causal mechanism. If you don't have that, it's not good science. Well, Newton got himself into trouble on this very point when it came to gravity because he has this great equation that works perfectly. And it works not only here in the terrestrial realm with billiard balls and, and things like that, but it applies to the planets as well. So, you know, it's this huge unifying idea. But then when the question came, well, what's the mechanism? These things are pulling each on each other. How's that work? What's doing the pulling? And Newton famously said, I don't, I don't have anything. I got, I got nothing. I don't have a, a causal mechanism. This equation works, but I don't, I don't have a causal mechanism. It, it, is, it is action at a distance, uh, so, so it seems. And, and people really hated that and, and, and you know, tried to come up with some sort of you know, mechanism, some sort of you know, causal explanation uh, for gravity, and eventually just became comfortable with the idea. Eventually, that shaping principle just, uh, just went away because it looked like there just wasn't, they weren't going to find one. And so that's a good example of the and at one point in history for mechanical explanations using contact forces that eventually just gave way because it looks like there really is this thing, gravity. And yeah, it's a little spooky, but you know, it really does seem to be such a thing as a force. We have to allow forces that act at a distance in science. Dr. Kopersky, myth number two is, science and religion have completely different methods, one based on evidence and the other based on authority. You know, there's some truth to that. Theologians don't use microscopes. They don't conduct double-blind experiments. So in a very fine-grained sense, that's probably true because every discipline has its own specialized methods, its own jargon. But at a sufficiently high level, I think actually we're pretty much all doing the same thing. I think that most of what goes on among theoreticians is what philosophers call inference to the best explanation. So this is the idea that we tend to think that our best explanation for, for a given set of data is most likely true. Not infallible, but at least provisionally true. And we're all familiar with this. So this is what physicians do. You come in with a set of symptoms, and you've got a family history, and maybe some test results, and your physician is then going to come up with the best explanation of all those things. And then given that diagnosis, he or she is going to decide how to treat you. Now, if the treatment doesn't work, well, that's new information, and then the physician will change the diagnosis accordingly. On a broad scale, this is what scientists, um, you know, they do this all the time. They have background knowledge, they have experimental data, they have a whole range of options, and they try to come up with the, the best explanations. Further tests might confirm those explanations, and further tests might go the other way, in which case they've, they've got to come up with, with something better. And this is what philosophers are largely doing. So Platonists about properties, they're arguing that's the best explanation given all of the relevant information. Nominalists think there's a better, simpler way to go about it. And ultimately, I would say this is what theologians and, and Bible scholars are doing. It's, it's inference to the best explanation. But now the, the data to be explained is going to include things like the scriptures and maybe some other things like the church fathers. So John Piper thinks that one view of justification is the best explanation for what we find in the scriptures. N.T. Wright thinks there's a, there's a better view, there's a better explanation. This is what you do all the time on this podcast, Dale. You, you argue that there's a particular understanding of Christ's divinity that's the best explanation for what the Bible says. And Latin Trinitarians say, no, there's a better one. And social Trinitarians say, no, we've got a, we've got a better one. 
But the arguments are all ultimately about who's got the better explanation. Where best here in terms of best explanation is going to be cashed out in terms of simplicity and coherence and the ability to, to deal with objections. And at the highest level, most scholars are doing the same thing. We're all doing inference to the best explanation that the main difference is going to be what counts as data. What is it that we're trying to explain? Another thing that seems to be wrong about this myth is contrasting evidence and authority. You know, some appeals to authority can be fallacious if that authority doesn't have any special knowledge about the subject right. matter, but there's nothing wrong with appealing to the authority of a chemist to tell me, you know, what's going to happen if I mix these two chemicals together. And if there really is divine revelation, then whoever has knowledge of that divine revelation would be an expert on whatever it's talking about. And so they, it wouldn't be a fallacious appeal to authority. It would just be a case of knowledge based on testimony. Right. We're a long way from the time when anyone could claim to know the whole of any given science. Nobody just knows physics, okay? People who specialize, say, in, uh, in particle mechanics, they don't know anything about continuum mechanics or maybe at least nothing that went beyond what they might have learned in graduate school. So, you know, there's a lot of hyper-specialization out there. And so, yeah, we're a long way from anybody just being an expert in any given field. The point is, we all rely on authority. We all have to rely on other people that we take to be experts in that other thing that, you know, is something other than our own field. There's no avoiding it. We're all constantly relying on authority on almost everything. Sure. Except for what our own little narrow subject is, if we're experts in anything ourselves, and then what we've directly experienced. But what we've directly experienced often isn't going to have a lot to do with the science, right? That's right. Even within our own narrow areas, even then, for people in that field other scholars whose opinion we tend to trust. And so, you know, mm -hmm. even there, uh, you know, we're, we're largely influenced by people that we trust in that area of specialization where we are supposed to be the experts. It's part of being a human being. Yeah. And we trust people that they trust too. And yeah, that's then, right. Yeah. Yeah. The circle kind of grows. It does. But this is a glorious thing about science that it's a, it is a search for the truth and a bunch of smart people really going at it hard in their own niches. In a sense, it's not different from other fields of knowledge like history or even theology. Sure. I think it's the same. That's right. It's just a matter of what is it that needs to be explained? What's going to count as data in this discipline as something that needs the best explanation? But ultimately, on a broad enough scale, it's, it's, the details will be different. Again, theologians don't use microscopes. But at a broad enough level, yeah, we're, we're really all doing the same thing. This is why most philosophers of science, one reason why, why we don't think there is a, a uniquely scientific method, because we're all doing this. We're all using inference to the, to the best explanation. This is, this is what your auto mechanic is doing. Uh, he doesn't know it, but you know, you got a problem with your car and you bring the car in. He does some tests and listens to what the problem is and is trying to come up with the, with the best explanation. Now, is that science? I don't know, but it's the, you know, call it what you want. It's the same sort of inference. Got your quantum mechanics and your Toyota mechanics. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and before we leave this myth, I think we should say something about evidence because I think one of those kind of sciencey sounding ideas that people get in their minds nowadays is that all evidence is empirical evidence. All evidence is sensory evidence in some sense, either the unaided senses or using instruments. Is that a view that philosophers of science take? Science involves all those shaping principles and just a lot more than just empirical observation. You wouldn't even know what to go study, what counts as valuable data, unless you had some shaping principles you know, coming into play. Epistemologists will talk about things such as testimony or intuitions as evidence. And it sounds like you are saying that because when you're considering different explanations of the observed facts, and then one of them seems to stand out as the best of the available explanations, then your evidence there is just your intuition that it seems simple, adequate, and has the other things that go into making something the best explanation. But then the evidence is, it's something in your mind. This is going to be why then you have disagreements in science and elsewhere is because there's somewhat of a subjective judgment here about you have all these things that go into best explanation. Simplicity is important, but then fit with what we already know, fruitfulness and all those other things that I mentioned. Those can be weighted differently in different cases. So some theories you know, can, can claim to be better on one set of explanatory virtues, even going all the way back to the, the Copernican stuff. 
So Copernicus, the Copernican models were, were much simpler. The calculations came a, a lot easier. But the earliest Copernican models weren't actually as accurate as the Ptolemaic models that they were trying to displace. That's not so good. Uh, it's great that they're simpler, but what you want them to be is accurate. It could be a trade-off. If you don't need too much accuracy, then simplicity might be the way to go. Again, when it comes to competing views, people can have you know, a different understanding of what's the best explanation because of the way they're applying the explanatory virtues. There's a subjective element to there, and yet some people are just better at it. Some people's intuitions, they have a better nose for the truth, don't they? Sometimes in a remarkable way. They're really cutting against the grain. They're making moves that most people would say you really, <laughs> that you shouldn't be doing that. It lacks, you know, mathematical rigor or that really isn't the way good science is done or something like that. And then you, you have these people who are going against the grain and then uh, turn out to be right in amazing ways. So how that happens exactly, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know, you know how that works. But yeah, there is a subjective aspect to it. Certainly it isn't that the evidence, the empirical data can just in, in any sort of deductive way point uniquely to one explanation, one theory. That just does not happen. Philosophers of science call that the underdetermination of theory by observation or by the evidence, right? Yes, exactly. There's always going to be more than one explanation. And so if we're going to choose one, if we're going to pursue one, then we're going to have to do it in some other way than just appealing to the evidence, to the data, because both of them will equally explain the evidence. When it comes to quantum mechanics, there's kind of a standard interpretation about how to take Schrodinger's equation. And there's a whole other way. It's a handful of scientists and some philosophers will know about this Bohmian mechanics, which is rather different. It's actually deterministic and, and doesn't have some of the funny stuff that standard quantum mechanics has. And the two are completely empirically uh, equivalent. There isn't any sort of test that you could run to show that one is the case and, and the other one is wrong. That's what it is to be uh, empirically equivalent. So which one are you going to choose? which view is the right one. It's going to be based on, on other things. It's going to be based on other shaping principles and explanatory virtues. So when you say it's subjective, you don't mean that one choice is as good as another or it's purely a matter of opinion because, generally speaking, these rival theories can't both be true. You say it's subjective in that the evidence doesn't sort of jump up and tell you which theory best explains it. I'll withdraw subjective. That probably isn't the best description of it. It's that there isn't proof. There isn't some sort of definitive test that you can run that shows you what the right answer is. But it can be different from person to person. You know, somebody who's a dummy in the subject like me might just be baffled by it. And yet somebody who's a really advanced practitioner might just go in a certain direction for reasons that I don't get. Right. That's just background knowledge. That's going to be the way it works. If you could see it, with the background that the other person has, it might seem you know, perfectly natural and the way to go. But if you don't have that, then yeah, it just seems like they're doing something you know, very, very, very odd. Myth number one is, modern science has revealed that the cosmos is a closed system whose causes and effects are only physical. What I would want to know is, when exactly that was discovered? What theory, what observation tells us that the universe is closed? Because people who say this sort of thing, what they're using it is as a, as a kind of tool or principle against miracles. Or they might be materialists who don't like mind-body dualism. They don't like the idea of, of souls or immaterial minds. And so they'll say things like, the universe is closed, and science has shown that the, the universe is closed, which means that nothing like an immaterial being, like a soul or God, could have any sort of causal influence on nature. But as far as I can tell, that's only true if metaphysical naturalism is true. Because again, there's no theory that shows closure. So I think it kind of just begs the question, as far as I can tell, as a matter of the science alone, there's no theory that shows we live in a closed rather than an open universe. As far as I can tell, causal closure, this whole closure business, it's just a, another version or a close cousin of methodological naturalism. 
closure says that when you're doing science, we should proceed as if the universe were closed. So good causal explanations will, will generally appeal to, to physical causes. The thing is, I think most theists could agree with that. That is going to be true most of the time. But as I've said before, all of these shaping principles, whether it's causal closure or methodological naturalism, they're provisional. There's no guarantee here now that you will always be able to find a naturalistic cause out there in the future. So, I mean, to put it differently, I don't see any sense in which science has shown that miracles are impossible. We start talking about closure, that's what people are worried about. If, if theism is true, then God can act in the physical world. Now, how God acts, how that works, what's the mechanics of it, how often God acts, those are different questions. Whether God has to break any laws of nature when acting, that's still another question. I deal with those in the book some. But look, as as soon as you hear some sort of objection that starts with science shows that, you should ask, well, where? Where exactly does the science show that? Because in these sorts of debates, a lot of what is called science is really just naturalistic philosophy in a trench coat and sunglasses. (laughs) When somebody says science shows that, that's when you should check and make sure your wallet's still there. I want to know where. (laughs) Could you could you be a a bit? Science is a big thing. Okay, so you know, I want to go look this up. Then as soon as you ask that, it's going to be kind of hard to, to cash out. Really, it's probably more of the mythology of science than actual science. Some of the lore, some of the narrative that goes along with it. Yeah. People do this because they want the prestige of science, right? Of course, because if science has shown something, that's a weighty bit of evidence that really does kind of count against your view to some degree. Uh, But then the question is, well, is that really the case or are people just claiming it to be the case? It's hard to see how any empirically based observation could inform us that the system is closed. I mean, if we could discover some contradiction, some obvious impossibility in the idea of something that's not a part of the universe causing an event within the universe, well, then that would show it to be impossible. But, I mean, what would that be? Or if there's some sort of barrier or some, you know, literally a physical barrier. Like in the, the original Star Trek series, uh, there was supposed to be at the edge of the galaxy this kind of barrier, right? And if you drove the Enterprise into it, it bounced you back and, and all that. So if there was something like that, if we discovered something on the edges of the universe, uh, if there were edges of the universe that was like that, then maybe you could make a case. It's just, we don't have anything like that. There are no barriers. There's no physical reason to say that it's a closed system acting as if it's a closed system and ignoring any sort of you know outside influence sure that's probably the best assumption to, to go by when we're doing science but you know that's an assumption it's not something that science has discovered the myth science has revealed this again where was this revealed so when someone says that science says fill in the blank you think it's a good idea to, in general, call their bluff. Like, when was that? (laughs) 1978? Which field was it? Was it physics, chemistry, biology? I'd like a little more detail. Yes, that's right. In my logic class, uh, my intro to logic class in the the textbook I use, they identify this as one of the logical fallacies. When a claim gets made, something like, well, experts have shown, or something like that, well, that's a good claim if there really are experts in that area and they really have shown that. But a lot of times people just say that as kind of leverage. They think probably this has been said somewhere along the line and they want you to believe it. So, so they say experts have shown, well, maybe, maybe not. I'd really kind of like to know. In this context, what is called science, science has shown Too often, it's science mixed with some questionable naturalistic philosophy, and it's really the philosophy that's doing the work in the claim, rather than any science. Again, the book is called The Physics of Theism, God, Physics, and the Philosophy of Science by Jeffrey Kopersky. Dr. Kopersky, thank you for talking with us. I've been very glad to have this time with you, Dale. Thanks very much for having me. This week's thinking music has been the track Dawn's Battle Instrumental by Ivan Chu. We got a new review in the iTunes store in the USA. This is by a user named Happy Go Lucky 357 and it's a five-star review. The title line is Provocative and Perceptive Podcast for Thinkers. The reviewer goes on to say, quote, 
Simply put, this podcast is excellent. I have great admiration for the work Dale has done in philosophy generally, and moreover, the views he's defended both in published slash presented work and the Trinity's podcast, while not always readily accepted by the Christian majority, reveal his philosophical acumen and intellectual honesty. As a Christian myself, I'm quite grateful to have this podcast available to think through questions and issues that fall outside my own current research. Thanks to Dale for sacrificially making this material available to a wider audience and leading out as an example for other academics to follow who find themselves profitably wrestling with difficult topics. Thanks very much for the review. That's very kind. Glad to have you listening. And don't forget, if you enjoyed today's episode, please share it on social media like Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. If you're looking at the trinities.org blog in a desktop browser, there are buttons floating on the right-hand side that make it easy to do this in just a couple of clicks if you're logged into your account. And of course, if you'd like to give us a small monthly donation or just a one-time donation, there are orange buttons on the right side of any blog post. Again, if you're on a desktop browser and not on a phone or a pad. for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.